Jehovah's Witnesses of Interrupting Your Breakfast fame put out a monthly televangelist-style variety show called JW Broadcasting. Welcome to another edition of JW Broadcasting. It's been a while since I've talked about one in a scripted video, though. Mostly because they're all kind of the same. We warmly welcome all of you. We warmly welcome you. Welcome. 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 Each episode has a long, boring talk by a Watchtower higher-up, a slightly shorter, boring talk by a different Watchtower higher-up, a video dramatization of some made-up JW-specific scenario with terrible acting. What is on your mind? I can't believe the nerve that Ben has. An interview with a real Jehovah's Witness with terrible acting. Brother Robertson, how have you been able to comfort such ones? As an example, we called on a brother recently who was going through a great trial. Let's take a look at that. And didn't we just love the new original song? We all look forward to receiving these original songs. What a beautiful song and video. Beautiful. I think we'll all be singing He Knows Us for days, days to, come. to come. You could almost say there's something of a formula to JW Broadcasting. A recipe, if you will. Recipe, recipes, recipes. The recipe, a recipe, that's a beautiful ingredient in this recipe. JW Broadcasting has been going for 10 years now, and after seeing most of the episodes, I think I've figured out this recipe. And this month's edition of the broadcast is perfect for deconstructing what that recipe is. Because even by JW Broadcasting standards, the standards being literally cult propaganda, this one stands out as being one of the cultiest. I knew this day would come. True Christians expect opposition, but it hurt to see Brother Vassil get arrested. Even though we bear the truth, apostates and others may cast us as dishonest, as deceivers. Have you ever been confronted by a bad report, uh, a false report, about Jehovah's people. What really touched me the most was how clean Jehovah's people were. When troubles in my life take me far from kingdom realities. But if we're going to deconstruct the JW broadcasting recipe, we're going to have to start where this broadcast starts. Sweet potato pie? When I was young, one of my favorite desserts was my mother's sweet potato pie. It always tasted the same. To me, it was perfect every time. I'd often ask her, Ma, what do you put in here, Ma, 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 to make it taste so good? She'd always respond, I just use the same stuff every time. In other words, number one, she wasn't going to tell me. And two, she had a recipe that worked. So she never changed it. What a nice story. And I wish this could just be a video about sweet potato pie and whatever else this guy's mom is up to. But we're here to figure out how this corporate cult higher up is going to get from this little anecdote about sweet potato pies to this. Even though we bear the truth, apostates and others may cast us as dishonest, as deceivers. Well, I used to be a Jehovah's Witness, so I knew exactly what he was going to say the moment he started talking about making food. The Bible is like a cookbook, full of recipes that work, that can make our life spiritually successful. Please note how Paul explains the benefits of these recipes. This is a JW classic. You know how recipes are things that exist? Well, when you think about it, this list of stuff from the Bible is a spiritual recipe. And like that delicious sweet potato pie, if you follow Jehovah's recipe and put in a dash of love, it'll turn out a treat every time. I knew this was the leap in logic um, Anthony Griffin was going to make, not because I'm psychic as far as you know. Just as JW broadcasts have an overall structural formula, the main talk follows a similar recipe every time. And generic anecdote is the first ingredient. One part generic anecdote. As little boys, my brother and I would pet the goats that my grandfather had. One part dictionary definition of rudimentary words that nobody was confused by in the first place. But what exactly is time? One dictionary says it is a non-spatial continuum. 
Another says it is the thing that is measured as seconds, minutes, hours. One part saying that the thing from your anecdote has a metaphorical spiritual equivalent. Your short-term goal at this point is to get them off the runway and into a Bible study. If you do, that means the plane is taken off. And the cherry on top, we have the truth, and the opposite of the truth is a lie. You wouldn't want to live a lie, would you? Stay in the truth, trust everything we say no matter what, and never leave for any reason. It's a really big cherry. Put it in the oven, and you get to go to therapy later in life. Also, you should have put the cherry on top after you put it in the oven. Who wrote this cookbook? Richie? Let's see how all these delicious ingredients play off of each other. And let's also abandon this recipe framing device. I'm getting tired of it. Sometimes the recipe P from God's inspired word comes in the form of a Bible example. As we study that example, we extract qualities and attitudes that we can imitate. Other times, there's a list of qualities such as the various aspects of the fruitage of God's Spirit mentioned in Galatians chapter. I'm not an expert on logical fallacies, but this seems like fallacious logic. Anthony Griffin's mom using a recipe to bake a pie has nothing to do with whether basing your life around the list of personality traits from an old book is useful or reasonable. I guess what I'm saying is, this is a bad analogy. All of you have unity of mind, fellow feeling, brotherly affection, tender compassion, and humility. This is a recipe of five beautiful qualities that contribute to our spiritual success. How so? Let's discuss the ingredients. Using a list of spiritual qualities from the Bible to dictate the way you live your life is not the same thing as following a recipe to make a pie. Baking a pie is a process with a beginning, middle, and end. You start with your ingredients, Follow the recipe, and a few hours later, you get a, a pie. But being a Jehovah's Witness is a lifelong commitment. You're never not baking. It only ends when you're dead. And not even then, the way they see it. It's like if your whole life was pouring the same ingredients into the same bowl, over and over, while some guy in a suit who tells you he's appointed by God hovers behind you as you're baking and tells you you're doing it wrong. So you start over, and over, and over, and over, and you start over, over. thump it out, over. one cup over. of milk, and you start and over, over. And and you start over, and, and pour, and, and stir, and a little, little bit of cinnamon, and start a bit of cinnamon, until you get old and start wondering if maybe you should have just gone to the store and bought a pie 50 years ago when your knees still worked. If it seems like I'm being nitpicky of this guy's innocuous anecdote, that's because I am. Because to Jehovah's Witnesses, this isn't supposed to be just some televangelist program with crappy analogies by men who talk like they just popped three Benadryls. Uh, Jehovah's Witness leadership tells members this is spiritual food from God. The God. Today, Jehovah invites us to a banquet that is spiritually nourishing. Bible-based videos and publications draw us close to God. God created the infinite majesty of the cosmos, the human brain, and pelicans. But we're supposed to believe that this is the best Jehovah can come up with? This is the best spiritual food on the planet? As little boys, my brother and I would pet the goats that my grandfather had. Taste is subjective, of course, but setting aside my gripes with Anthony's delivery, shouldn't Jehovah's personal internet TV show to hold up to scrutiny? Hang on, Jehovah's Witness in the comments. Hang on, Vusi M. Jehovah uses imperfect people. The broadcasts aren't going to be perfect, but why not? Why couldn't God inspire the governing body or their helpers the same way he inspired the Bible writers? Moses was not a perfect man. The Watchtower says the Bible accounts he wrote were perfect because God beamed like the Holy Spirit into his hands? Was it weird for Moses when he wrote about his own death in the past tense? So Watchtower says Jehovah inspired Moses and the other apostles and Bible writers. Aren't the governing body taking the lead in the same way those imperfect men took the lead? And God inspired them despite them being imperfect, right? So why can't he inspire the governing body? Why does he instead use lifeless corporate drones who speak like an AI impression of a preschool teacher and smell like butt crack and polyester? I'm assuming. What's the answer? We simply don't know. 
We can't be dogmatic. Oh, I guess we just don't know why these talks are so boring, infantilizing, and repetitive. But I'll tell you my theory. This long, almost hypnotically boring introduction only exists to distract Jehovah's Witnesses from the real message Watchtower is building up to. See, here's the thing with cults. Despite whatever complicated doctrines they claim to have, the only one that matters is this. Do what the leader says no matter what. That's it. Do what we tell you. So what were the ingredients in our recipe for spiritual success? First was unity of mind. Be at unity with Jehovah's organization today by keeping calm and showing trust. In the words of the Shunammite woman in 2 Kings chapter 4, when facing adversity, always know that with Jehovah, everything is all right. Sometimes in Watchtower's more desperate moments, they'll just say this outright. They'll say, even if it doesn't make sense, just obey the direction we're giving you. I personally have benefited from following the governing body's direction. I've actually felt joy every day. And I can only put that down to the blessing from Jehovah God on our efforts to be obedient. We both benefited from the direction from the governing body because we trust they are the faithful and discreet slave Christ Jesus is directing them. I am so absolutely grateful to the governing body for providing direction that is blessing every single one of us around the earth. Now, of course, cult leaders can't only say this. That'd be a little suspicious. Their adherents would likely be able to see through it. No, cult leaders have to make members think their ideas are based on some sacred source, be it the Bible, Dianetics, or the leader's own intellect. Random JW NPC number 87 here, I mean Anthony, is wittingly or unwittingly using a rhetorical trick. The only thing he is attempting to convey is don't leave Jehovah's Witnesses no matter what. And if you do leave, you need to come back or God will kill you. So just do what we say and you'll be safe. But that would be an off-putting message on its own. So he has to start with something folksy and mundane, like an anecdote about food. My mother's sweet potato pie. One part dictionary definition of rudimentary words that nobody was confused by in the first place. Empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. One part saying that the thing from your anecdote has a metaphorical spiritual equivalent. Well, the Bible is like a cookbook, full of recipes that work. Then he makes some half-assed connection to a Bible verse to pretend like he's making a profound connection between your real life and something some guys wrote 2,000 years ago. Sometimes the recipe from God's inspired word comes in the form of a Bible example. He really milks it, too. Milk is a key ingredient in the JW Broadcasting Talk recipe. For seemingly as long as humanly possible, Anthony just recaps a passage from the Bible. Except the recap is way longer than the account itself. Let me tell you about this woman. Her example of trust in Jehovah's representative is worthy of imitation. In fact, there is an expression she uses in chapter 4 that conveys the level of trust we have in Jehovah and his earthly today. Let me tell you about this woman. She has a ministry. She might have a great relationship with her and his the boy complained of a headache, which led to his eventual death. Oh my. There's a lot of fluff, but his deep spiritual point, which is so profound you could only learn it in Jehovah's One True Organization is, a long time ago, some lady had a trusting relationship with a servant of God, and thanks to her blind faith in some guy who claimed to represent God, her son got resurrected. So this calm, trusting woman rides about 19 miles or 30 kilometers and finds Elisha and he ends up resurrecting her son. Her trusting relationship and association with Elisha had given her confidence. Although she experienced a tragedy, she knew that everything was all right. If you trust us, I mean, if we trust Jehovah and his representatives on earth, your dead family will be resurrected in paradise. The Bible lady had confidence in the man of the true God, Je <laughs> Elisha was a man of the true God, and the Bible lady had confidence in that man. A Shunammite is mentioned who had confidence in the prophet Elisha. She suffered a terrible tragedy in her life, yet... 
she remained calm and showed trust in the man of the true God, Elisha. And that clearly means you, you specifically right now, should have faith in the current man of the true God, the governing body and their governing buddies. That's what I'm going to start calling the governing body helpers, by the way. Governing buddies. All this crap, anecdotes, illustrations, graphics, long recitations of spiritual accounts, Anthony's mom, gives witnesses the impression that they're learning something really deep. Wow, look at how he's able to glean so much out of this Bible passage and apply it to our day. I mean, it sure took a lot of time for him to say all that. He said a lot of words, so it probably was deep. This feeling of depth is what the governing body and buddies are going for. Put enough frosting and sprinkles on top, and the audience might not realize that the pie you made doesn't hold up to scrutiny. I don't know, why did I go back to the baking? Like, let's pretend pretend for a moment that the authors of this verse in Isaiah had no idea that thousands of years after their death, a man in something called the United States would be talking into something called a camera for a sermon that would be something called broadcast over something called the internet. Let's pretend they didn't know that and just wrote it for their fellow Israelites at the time. Well, if that's true, then this verse isn't about Jehovah's Witnesses at all, is it? It's authored by and intended for ancient Israelites. That would mean God is saying, hey, the Israelites, do not be afraid, for I am with you, the Israelites specifically. But Anthony, and more specifically Anthony's bosses, needs you to believe that when this verse says you, it means literally you. Whoever you are reading this now in the year 20... <laughs> Unless you're not a Jehovah's Witness, in which case you need to become one before this verse can apply to you. Man, they're like Jehovah's Witnesses. They don't give up. I don't get it. Why don't they just kick your door down? Sorry, we're rewatching Breaking Bad for like the 15th time right now. Anthony's full-time job is to tell witnesses what Watchtower says the Bible means when it says stuff. And it just so happens that the Bible is always saying... Trust what the leaders of Jehovah's Witnesses say. That's pretty lucky for Jehovah's Witness leadership. You know, imagine if the Bible affirmed the beliefs of some other religion, or wasn't inspired of God at all. Thankfully, that's impossible, but just imagine it for a second. So the leaders say, this random verse might just look like a list of stuff in an old book, but it's really a delicious spiritual recipe from our God, Chef Jehovah, that will keep you, a J.W. sous chef, from Satan's... Mac, I don't know, why did I do the baking thing again? There's a lot of fluff, but at the end of the day, or the beginning of the day, depending on when you're watching this, all that happened here is a man talked for long enough to make witnesses forget that he's just some stranger telling 8 million other strangers how to live their life. Nice work if you can get it, I guess. Anyway, this wasn't even the culty part of the broadcast. The final quality highlighted in 1 Peter 3.8 is humility. Why do we need humility? Because we need to trust. Trust in Jehovah and his organization requires humility, not relying on our own strength or wisdom. So here we are. Humility helps us trust Jehovah no matter what. But you may have noticed, Jehovah doesn't speak out loud to people so much these days. So let's just say humility helps us trust in what these guys say Jehovah says. Humility to Jehovah's Witnesses sounds a lot like blind subservience. When we face anxiety and pressure in our life, we may yearn for immediate relief. But humility helps us to trust that Jehovah knows precisely when and how to act in our behalf. So we wait, patiently. Jehovah always responds to our needs in his time and in his way. Oh, Jehovah always responds to our needs. How comforting. Now, you might wonder, if you're some cynical atheist type, did God respond to this lady's needs? Or this sad, dying child? Or this sad, dying child? Or these sad, dying children? Are these Jehovah's Witness children who died because they refused blood transfusions? I don't know, maybe their need was to die from fatal blood. I guess these starving people and innocent children just weren't humble enough, is what a cynical atheist type might say. But Anthony is saying, Jehovah only responds to your needs if you are humble. And only in Jehovah's time 
and in Jehovah's way. But humility helps us to trust that Jehovah knows precisely when and how to act in our behalf. And his way might be to not do anything for years and years and years. So we wait. Or his way might even be something you can't recognize as God's will with your imperfect eyes. Humility helps us to admit that Jehovah's thoughts are vastly superior to our own. We recognize our limited discernment in comparison with Jehovah's all-encompassing perception. Even nothing might be a response from God. Or maybe you just haven't gotten the response yet. Or maybe you did get a response, but you didn't realize it. All I know is it's not the prayer doesn't work. If you feel your prayers aren't being answered, that's a you problem. He sees things we do not discern, and thus we trust that his way of doing things is always best. I never really understood this as a witness, and I understand it less now. How does that work, higher thoughts? This idea that God has higher thoughts than us? Jehovah's thinking, Jehovah's viewpoint is so lofty, isn't it? So elevated. God has a supremely intelligent way of viewing everything. So we can't possibly understand his 4D chess reasoning for letting your baby die. From Jehovah's standpoint, what's the utility of him having higher thoughts that we humans can't understand? Isn't the onus on God to explain his higher thoughts to us humans in a way we can understand? He made us in his image, but intentionally made us dumber than him? That's rude. And how complicated can it be for God to just explain his higher thoughts to humans? I mean, if he can't, doesn't that imply that he's not all-powerful? Humans have been to the moon, we've split the atom, decoded DNA. Why can't God make a helpful video essay that explains things in plain English? Why doesn't God start a YouTube channel like everyone else who thinks they're smart? Jehovah says in verse 9, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. This whole idea of excusing anything that appears to contradict God's supposed love or existence because God's thoughts are just too smart for us puny humans sounds suspicious, almost. Without all these excuses, the world looks exactly like one we'd expect to see where no God exists at all. We trust that his way of doing things is always best. We trust. Don't we, everyone? We recognize, we trust, we need to trust. We all trust that Jehovah's way of doing things is best. And Jehovah's way of doing things is expressed via video programs, magazines, and letters to congregation elders. Jehovah's way of doing things looks and sounds pretty much identical to man's way of doing things. Like, I'm not God. Making videos on the internet and writing letters sounds like something I would do. Isn't God's way of doing things like zapping commandments onto tablets, tongues of fire over the heads of holy ones, a cloud or something, giving Christians gifts of the spirit? You know, stuff only God can do, so we know it's really God doing it. Why does God's way of doing things look like an American corporation's way of doing things? I'm noticing something, though, as I'm editing this segment. Uh, I'm jumping back in here because I've noticed in the pictures and in this very broadcast, when it suits them, they portray the miracles of the Bible as not being particularly miraculous. The way that God communicated with humans uh, is just kind of boring and normal looking. Uh, you can see this image on the screen where they clearly just put side by side or up by down. The actual biblical accounts that the uh, top row is depicting are full of miracles, things that could only happen through God magic. But the thing below, which is the modern governing body, is just a bunch of old men sitting in a boardroom uh, looking at a book or a computer and just talking about what they think about stuff. And they've strategically picked these images for the top row where the patriarchs of the Bible and the apostles are just kind of boring old white guys. Hey, they're just sort of sitting around reading a scroll which is just an old-timey book. They were just getting letters and stuff, so it's the same. Anyway, sorry, I, I this is already getting out of control and I keep adding stuff, but uh, I keep noticing little things. There is no better place to be than under the mighty hand of God. 
Humility is a beautiful ingredient that helps us to remain there. There's no better place to be than under the mighty hand of God, which looks suspiciously similar to being under the mighty boot of a doomsday cult. It looks exactly like that, actually, like identical to a doom. In the words of the Shunammite woman in 2 Kings chapter Kings, when facing adversity, always know that with Jehovah, everything is all right. In the words of the Shulamite woman. In the words of the Shunammite woman. Why did God name so many men in the Bible, but not so many women? What would this woman do? Was that humility on the part of the Shulamite woman? Was the Shulamite woman like an anonymous source? You can use my story for your book, just don't use my name. I don't want to draw attention to myself. Let me tell you about this woman. Otherwise, it seems like a bunch of crackpot Christians trying to trick people into thinking the Bible is somehow not a deeply misogynistic text. Well, I know this lady. Now, before we get to this next clip, I want to tell you a story. A made-up story about a made-up couple named Bill and Jill. Bill and Jill had a happy marriage, but they had some rough times too. They started doing drugs recreationally at parties, but over time it became less recreational. It became, for Bill, an addiction, and thus a strain on the marriage. So eventually, Bill and Jill get divorced. But then, years later, they reconnect after Jill joins the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The church gives Jill a new perspective on marriage and relationships, and she gets back together with Bill. After a while, they get remarried, and now they're both in the Mormon church, relatively happy. The end. That didn't help at all! First of all, it was a great story well told, you have to admit. Now, that story, did that sound like a miracle? A divine love story? Or did it just kind of sound like a mundane story that probably happens to a lot of people all over the world in all sorts of different religions? Well, for no reason, let's now watch the next segment. In the following interview, note how applying a recipe of Bible principles can also undo the damage caused by poor decisions. We graduated in June, got married in July, had a child in November. <laughs> well, it was a happy tappy. At one point, two witnesses knocked on my door and they showed me Psalm 8318. God's name is Jeho. They offered a Bible study, but my study only lasted 83 weeks. We got a car. We started going to parties, starting to smoke, have drugs, parties, starting to smoke, getting drunk. We did all of these things that really tore our marriage apart. We thought moving away from our town and our old associates would help. It, it was worse than ever. Baseball was more important to me than even my wife. I had a real problem with headship. There were times when I felt like I was smarter than him. So I felt like I could make a better decision than he could make. In time, Jana left me for another person, and that's and that's what really hurt me. Zayna had a hard time with drugs and parties, drugs and so forth. And that's when I got custody of the kids. I decided at that moment I was done. And Jeho popped into my member getting down and telling Jeho. Just, just show me, show me what to do. I went through the telephone book and looked up Jehovah's Witnesses. They gave me a book, the telephone book. I showed him that book, the telephone book. And I told him, had we applied this telephone book in our marriage, from the beginning, our marriage would have never broke up. My mind was going, but I see she was doing things in a spiritual way. She stopped doing drugs, and I just saw her uh, mannerism change in that short period of time. 
Things got better and 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 better. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? So you see what I did. Stripped of the emotional music and pro witness spin, this isn't a miraculous story at all. It's a nice story, I guess. But people get divorced and remarried all the time. This is not the only video like this, by the way. Videos like this are a key ingredient of the JW broadcasting recipe. Remember when I tried to make that the through line of the video and kind of gave up? In case you were thinking it, this is not a Watchtower cooking show. Every JW broadcast has a tearjerker story about someone finding the witnesses, or almost leaving, or leaving and then coming back, or whatever. And after watching a zillion of them, I have some questions. Why aren't there ever any examples of relatively happy people in the world joining the religion purely because it's true? Throughout my childhood, I didn't receive the love a child should have from his family. I lost my father to alcoholism when I was very young. And then my older brother committed suicide. When you are little, you just want to be happy. But sadly, my father had a problem with alcohol. Witnesses call it the truth. So why isn't the fact that it's just plainly true never the motivating factor? Why is it instead always people who have reached rock bottom and only at the lowest time in their life when they were willing to accept just about anything that might improve their situation that they joined the Jehovah's Witnesses? So I had this conviction that the Creator exists and yet on the other hand, I was deep into gambling. I knew Jehovah saw it all and I hated myself. I reached a real breaking point in my life. I asked Luba, what should I do? So then I suggested that he read the Bible. Feelings of emptiness just wouldn't leave me alone. You know, the strongest feeling of emptiness and loneliness is that of a creation without its creator. And why is it almost always addiction, by the way? I was trying to raise a child while addicted to drugs. So we grew up with those values and those ways of thinking that led us to become a group that was known and feared in the area because of our violent, immoral lifestyle devoted to drugs. Sober, he was a good, kind, attentive husband. But when he was drunk, he was a completely different person. Is there some kind of correlation between people struggling with addiction and joining religions? Probably not. It's probably just that the religion is super true. Besides, you might say, the Bible's advice worked. They're still together, as of the filming of this video. To which I'd say, yeah, of course they're together. They joined a religion where there are extreme consequences, both social and judicial, for ever getting divorced. I don't think Jehovah's Witnesses have uniquely unhappy families or uniquely happy families. Like worldly marriages, there are plenty of both. I knew a lot of really happy families as a Jehovah's Witness, but I also knew a bunch of miserable ones. And despite the consequences, some Jehovah's Witnesses get divorced anyway. I don't have any data here because Watchtower conveniently doesn't have any, but it seems that the organization's marriages succeed at about the rate of chance. Baseball is more important to me than even my wife. Next in the broadcast is a long, boring video about translation software the organization made. Oh, wait, sorry. It's about how this God-ordained technological advancement has made possible the greatest witness in history. See how this technology has helped to unite Jehovah's people and has opened the way for us to give the greatest witness in history. The greatest witness in history. Some quick context for my never Jehovah's Witness subscribers. Uh, giving a witness, what does that mean? Well, it's a tricky one to define. Today we're gonna practice how to start a conversation that could lead to a witness. Giving a witness sort of means reflecting the glory of God, and also sort of means showing people that Jehovah's Witnesses, the religion, uh, is good. It's a good religion. I wanted to start a conversation, but I didn't want to bother them either. And when an opportunity came, I just froze. Then I was in a rush to give a witness. So obviously knocking on doors is giving a witness, but also if a witness kid in middle school explains to his science class why he doesn't believe in evolution, that's giving a witness. One time the class was given the assignment to pick a topic for a persuasive speech. 
So I decided to use that opportunity to give a witness and chose the topic evolution versus creation. Giving your coworker whose grandma just died a brochure is giving a witness. Making a passing reference to JW.org in line at the grocery store is giving a witness. So it's sort of a nebulous term. It means giving glory to God, reflecting the glory of God, and demonstrating the purity of Jehovah's Witnesses, the religion, all at the same time. I never really understood when linguists would try to explain some obscure Spanish phrase or something and say something like, eh, we don't have a phrase for that in English, but I get it now. Giving a witness does not make sense in English. And it's literally in English. Well, sort of. It's theocratic language, or the pure language of the truth, to use Jehovah's Witness terms. But a lot of people would call it group speak. The thing called to. I guess that wasn't real quick context at all, I'm sorry. Okay, so this is, and I mean this seriously, a pretty neat story. It's interesting. Unpaid volunteers working at a religious compound pioneered a new translation technology. That's cool, but I might just mention that Watchtower isn't presenting this story because it's neat. They want to use this as evidence that God's Holy Spirit is guiding this, and only this, organization. Almost all of Jehovah's Witnesses are now able to study the same spiritual food at our meetings at the same time. Truly a modern-day miracle. Only in Jehovah's organizations it's such an incredible technological... Who invented the computer? Or the internet? Were they Jehovah's Witnesses? Who invented electricity, for that matter? Not a Jehovah's Witness. And what about the most important invention of all time? The Nintendo GameCube bongo controller for DK Jungle Beat. Not a Jehovah's Witness in the bunch. Now, do you think Bethel itself could exist without worldly inventions? Without electricity, the internet, and a steady supply of Nintendo games, those 20-year-old cult victims trapped in a compound would never get anything done. So, when Jehovah's Witnesses invent something, that's touted as evidence of God's hand. Truly, a modern-day miracle. But when Satan's world invents something, that's a fluke or a freebie, and as a matter of fact, Jehovah's people can just steal it and use it guilt-free. Maybe Jehovah used them to invent it somehow. His ways of thinking are so much higher than ours. I mean, who cares if Shigeru Miyamoto ends up surviving Armageddon? Jehovah used him in some cosmic way to give us those bongos. We got what we needed out of the old bastard. Now, I said that this was a cool story about how a bunch of unpaid volunteers who worked at a religious compound innovated this new technology, and that is what the story is, but none of them get credit. They're just referred to as brothers or sisters. A group of brothers and sisters. But you know who does get credit? Even before the MEPS project began, the governing body realized that if Jehovah's Witnesses worldwide could somehow study the same material each week at meetings, it would unite them as never In the end, the story of MEPS is more than a story of technology. It's one of love. Love moved the governing body to seek better ways to provide spiritual food to people of every tribe and tongue. As a result of that love, and with Jehovah's Holy Spirit. Oh yeah, and like Jehovah and Holy Spirit or whatever. At this point, we're only about halfway through the runtime of the broadcast proper, but we've already excavated all of Watchtower's rhetorical techniques. The recipe. There is nothing new under the sun, or in the remaining 30 minutes of this particular episode of JW Broadcasting. So the three dramatizations that follow are just, once I had a hard time living up to the JW standard. Others seem to get so many privileges. Why not me? I was afraid of going to prison for my faith. True Christians expect opposition, but it hurt to see Brother Vassil get arrested. I was annoyed at my cuck husband for not finding a job. I appreciate that he supports me in the pioneer ministry, but shouldn't he focus on finding work? I was jealous of another woman in the hall who got to do more unpaid labor than me. I was so happy when I heard Nicole got invited to SKE. <laughs> but as I kept thinking about it, I started to feel empty. But the moral lesson to all three of these is the same as everything we've seen so far. 
Listen to what the leaders tell you, and never leave the group for any reason. Pray, go to more meetings, and if you have to go to prison, well, so did John the Baptist. At least beheadings are less common in the year of our Lord 2024. We have the aforementioned, slightly shorter, boring talk by a different Watchtower higher-up, which is about, what does one do if one sees a negative news report about Jehovah's Witnesses? Have you ever been confronted by a bad report, uh, a false report, about Jehovah's people? Hey, it's me again, Future Jake. I, I'm sorry I keep adding stuff, but we actually do need to talk about something with Seth Hyatt. Now, I talked about this on a recent live stream, but Seth Hyatt has a very unique way of talking. Stand. Blood. Clean. And in addition to doing a strange Mr. Ed-type horse noise for certain one-syllable words... Speech. Truth. Small. Truth. He also just takes ridiculously long pauses between every statement. So in order for this talk to be coherent, I'm going to cut out all the long pauses between statements, and you can just hear what it would sound like if he talked at a relatively normal pace. Um, but I think that the responsible thing to do is also is to play the the all the silence that I cut out. So I'm going to cut out all the silence so you can hear him talk normal. But then I'm going to you I'm going to string together all the silence that you missed. All right. I hope you're liking the video. Have you ever been confronted by a bad report, uh, a false report about Jehovah's people? It uh, may be a newspaper article or a segment on the evening news or perhaps some subject is brought up in the ministry. It could be a broad range of subjects. Uh, our neutral stand, our stand on blood, our adherence to Jehovah's elevated moral standards and appreciation for the sanctity of marriage, or our insistence on keeping the congregation clean by disfellowshipping unrepentant wrongdoers. So when we're confronted with negative, false reports, we're not surprised. The question is, how will we respond? The answer? Don't worry about it. Keep calm and show trust in Jehovah and his board of directors. And we're not surprised that we will be the target of negative reports. At times, we may even be cast in the role of deceivers. And Jehovah has frankly told us that there are some who are willing to exchange the truth of God for the lie. But that will never be true of you or me. Instead, we hold to Jehovah, the God of this lady. Uh. Angry? Satan Nothing No We then have yet another interview with the guy who had the temerity to leave the organization for a while. My father, when I was growing up, you know, him and his friends, they worked very hard, but they also drank a lot. There was a lot of violence and heavy drinking, and of course this sometimes came into home life as well. By the time I was 14, I'd started drinking, and sometimes I fought with my father and my stepfather. A few years after I got baptized, I moved to Germany. And during that time, unfortunately, I was disfellowshipped from the Christian congregation. 
Guess what lesson he needed to learn? I spoke with the elders and uh, told them of my intent to attend all the meetings and to serve Joho whole soul. And after a period of time, I was reinstated in the congregation. When I tried to do things my own way, my life ended up uh, out of balance, a mess. I was so unhappy, but with Joho in my life, it gave me more balance in my life. It was about learning to accept Jehovah's love. And when I did that, I started to make progress because I was able to accept Jehovah's love, but I was also able to accept the love through the brothers in the congregation. And last, of course, we have the original song, which we all love and appreciate. We all look forward to receiving these original songs. It's about how if you're a miserable sad sack who is foolish enough to leave Jesus Christ's favorite multi-level marketing scheme, you should come back or God will kill you. So I'm not gonna go through these beat by beat. First of all, because I already did that with the Seth Hyatt talk. Link in the description. Like and subscribe, Patreon. hit the bell. the bell. Second of all, because then I'd just be saying the same thing over and over to hammer home a very obvious point. And that's kind of Watchtower's thing. But I do have a few scattered observations about the remaining materials. Like this dramatization about prison and stuff. Uh, is it a dramatization? But what if we face a situation where we personally begin to wonder if Jehovah is blessing us? Let's see how lessons from the life of John the Baptist can help us remain certain of Jehovah's love and protection. They don't actually specify. Usually the broadcast host or convention speaker will introduce something like this by saying something like, in the following dramatization, or in the following scenario. Now in the following dramatization, you will note that Nita learns the importance of maintaining enthusiasm. And a few times they've even put dramatization in the lower left hand corner like you see on prescription drug commercials. But Anthony doesn't do that here. He just plays this thing. You might recall nine hours ago when I mentioned that the dramatizations and interviews both seem to be acted poorly acted. Usually the only way we even know the difference between truth and dramatization is because Watchtower specifies, but here they don't. Now, I grew up around Jehovah's Witnesses almost exclusively. They don't all talk like this all the time. Jehovah's Witnesses in real life are just people with quirks and colorful personalities who act and sound differently from one another. But broadcast, the meetings, and the ministry are not real life. They are the performance. Witnesses literally have rehearsal for these performances every week at their midweek meeting. Look at how robotic and eerily fake these demonstrations are. The former things have passed away. Thank you. So what does this say that God will do? It says he'll wipe out our tears, take away death, take away pain. Exactly. All of the problems that can make life seem hopeless today such as poverty, injustice, sickness, even death, will no longer exist. What we just watched is the good example. It is what you should do. That's how witnesses are apparently supposed to sound if they do everything just right. Perhaps this is why the interviews with real Jehovah's Witnesses and the reenactments with what we might charitably call actors are often indistinguishable. Watchtower has a specific way they want witnesses to speak act, sound, and dress when giving a witness to the world. Let's do some color correction on that personality of yours before you knock on someone's door, Sister Jones. As I covered in the last brainwashing masterclass about convention symposiums, characters from Watchtower videos are often spoken about by leadership as if they're real people. Do you remember when Nita first met Jade? Jade said, like I'm jaded. The English word jaded means Caleb and Sophia, Jade and Nita, for example, are just characters, but they have become, to Watchtower, like Bible characters, a cultural reference that all Jehovah's Witnesses understand. Maybe it doesn't matter whether this segment is real. I mean, it's a cult. We know none of it is real, but Jehovah's Witnesses have to view it all as the truth, even the stuff that's literally stated to be fictionalized. So what does it matter if Watchtower blurs the lines just a little further? Uh, let's see. The Seth Hyatt talk features the laziest, most insidious Watchtower thought-stopping cliché. Now the serpent was the most cautious of all the wild animals of the field that Jehovah had made. So it said to the woman, 
Did God really say that you must not eat from every tree of the garden? Now, we learn something about Satan's method. He didn't begin with a statement. He began with a question, and not just a question, a question that was designed to sow seeds of doubt. Did God really say that? Ah, the satanic tactic of asking a question. So any question that presupposes that the listener is wrong about something, that's a satanic tactic, apparently. Jehovah's Witnesses would never do that. Uh-oh, it's the book, What Does the Bible Really Teach? This is the same exact technique Seth is talking about. Is it really so? Will you really die if you eat the forbidden fruit? A question that was designed to sow seeds of doubt. Do you really know what the Bible teaches? Is God really a trinity? Is God really to blame for our suffering? Who really rules the world? It's just a lie. There's nothing satanic about uh, asking a question. Jehovah's Witnesses love asking questions that cause the listener to doubt their existing religious beliefs. That's what the ministry is all about. They have instruction manuals and video demonstrations about asking effective questions. But anyone who asks if Jehovah's Witnesses have the truth, though that's only that's something only Satan would do, or people who are ignorant of Satan's schemes. You see, some people are being used as Satan's puppets unwittingly. Lastly, we have the song. I do want to talk about the song, or specifically I want to talk about the music video. But I don't want to play the music because I find it viscerally triggering. It seems almost perverse that something as expressive and beautiful as music could be used for such cynical, pragmatic purposes. Not that propaganda music is anything new. I just don't like it. I'm a brave person for saying that Christian propaganda music is cringe. So I'm going to go through this in what might appear to be the laziest way possible, scrolling through and in real time commenting on it without a script, but it's not lazy. It's self-care. Self-care is low-effort content. It's a, it's a return to Jehovah song. A sad sack fucking loser who used to be a witness is just sitting around sad. He's sitting sadly watching the news and thinking, Oh boy, it's the Armageddon. Of course, I know it must be coming. I still know it's true. I still have all my books on the shelf. The witnesses knock on the door, and he's like, it's a sign, it's a sign from Jehovah, and he lets them in, and they read a scripture. I'm just literally just scrolling through this and <laughs> commentating over it in real time. That's, that's the level I've sunk to. This late, in this economy, this is as good as you're gonna get. So he prays fervently to Jehovah, he goes to the meeting, and of course, he sees that everyone is so happy. Everyone's shaking his hand and talking to him. How? Wait, what? They're shaking his hand and talking to him? I guess that means he wasn't disfellowshipped. It probably would not be such a pleasant experience if he went back to the Kingdom Hall as a disfellowshipped person. Persian. I said that right. Because then he would be shunned. Uh, he would not be spoken to by these people. Uh, they might approach him and say hi, and he would have to go, oh, I'm, just, I'm just fellowshipped. And they go, oh, so sorry. And it'd be really weird, and his heart would drop in his chest a little bit, and he would kind of trudge shamefully to the back room, the library, you know, the penalty box where they stick the sinners and the single moms. But anyway, yes, if you go back to Jehovah's Witnesses just because you've been inactive for a while, it's pretty easy to just go back and you will be love bombed. So now we have a montage, the likes of which I've never seen and will hopefully never see again. In fact, I'm going to make sure of it. I'm going to gouge my eyes out. They, sh they show a montage of people who were reactivated after being out of the organization for a long time. Just to correct some misinformation I've seen around the XJW internet, this is not a new term, reactivated. This has always been the case as long as I've been alive, and I'm old. If you stop going out in service for a while, I think it's six months, you become inactive. You are no longer considered an active member of the congregation. If a person comes back and starts regularly attending meetings and going out in service, they are then considered reactivated. It's mostly a term that elders use because they like keep the books, they keep track of who is active or inactive, and if they get someone reactivated, that's a little win. But yeah, this is not a new term. Uh, it's just a gross term. 
and there's something deeply creepy about seeing it applied to these smiling poor people. They don't, they don't know. You didn't have to go back. This isn't lost. Jack and Kate had to go back. It may, oh, fuck. God damn it. All right. Congratulations. I, I managed to merge the live stream and video essay format. Thanks to my laziness. I, I obviously was just scrolling through this video and reacting to it. I saved this for last because I didn't want to watch it. I had heard what it was. I obviously watched a, two seconds of it to put that clip at the beginning. And I didn't know about this shit. I didn't know about it's not too late to come home. Ay, ay, ay. First of all, this uh, implies that going home is necessarily a good thing which it's not always, because sometimes people have to run away from abusive homes, and you don't want to go back to that home for your own safety and emotional health. The other thing is they say it's not too late to come home. But of course, there will be a too late eventually, won't there? There will be a cutoff point. And the reason why I'm really upset about this is because this shit works. It works. Not everybody who leaves the organization uh, deconstructs their beliefs. In fact, most people who get disfellowshipped get disfellowshipped because they sin. You know, they sin, and they still, in their heart, think it's true. They never check, because this fear-mongering about the dangers of apostasy are very powerful. And so there are people who are free, who are out of the religion, but they don't view themselves as free. They view themselves as damned, as being doomed to destruction. They stay out because they don't have feelings of self-worth, because you are taught that your self-worth as a person is being an active Jehovah's Witness. Often when I was out riding my bike, and every time I passed the Kingdom Hall, I would ask the question, how am I going to return to Jehovah? I thought, well, Jehovah will never want me to come back. But there might be the odd Jehovah's Witness watching this. Uh, and they just uh, probably won't get why I find this so upsetting. In fact, they might find validating to their beliefs. They hear me uh, complaining about this video, and I fit the bitter apostate stereotype. And maybe they even feel validated that my satanic heart won't even listen to the songs. I don't know. I don't know you, straw man I've invented. And I don't know that I can change your mind, you know? I don't know how I can get a Jehovah's Witness to watch this video the way I see it. Um, but I do have an idea. 300 spices. 300 how many? All right. Jay, he's dragging it. There, there was never any question as to, is this going to happen? It's, what is it going to be like? The location sounded great. Uh, the type of people sounded great. As a youth, that's all I'd look forward to is, hey, I want to have those experiences too. I'm looking forward to that so much. It's going to be the greatest experience of my life. And so uh, I prepared and got ready, got all my stuff. Um, you know, gave everybody, gave everybody hugs and then off we went. You know, the first day was, was kind of a blur. I think it is for most people. It started to kind of hit me a little bit that night. It was the first night and I think reality just, you know, kind of started to hit with everybody. Oh, wow, I'm, my family's gone. As I was sitting in one of my classes, just started to have overwhelming feelings of darkness, depression, uh, just feeling extremely overwhelmed. And I started to doubt everything about myself, about my testimony, about uh, God's love for me. I, I thought, okay, what's happening to me? Eventually, uh, after going through this same kind of cycle so many times, I finally kind of said, it, okay, enough's enough. I can't, I can't do this anymore. And so I, I called up my parents and just said, hey, come get me. And you know, it was probably the hardest phone call that I've, that I've ever made. I ended up coming home on my little brother's 12th birthday and I had to walk through that door and see him with friends over on his birthday and him looking up to me with that, you know, look of confusion and concern, wondering what happened. Um, and that was hard. That was, that was very hard. Feeling like I let, let him down when 
he was he needed somebody to look up to from my standpoint i felt like okay this this can't be right i i i feel like i'm going against god's will for me and so i must be betraying him i couldn't even count the number of times that i asked myself did i make the right decision could i have stayed out what could i have done uh, to prevent this from happening and and what could i have done to make sure that i i did serve that uh full-time two-year mission and i've come to realize since then that god does not ask us those kinds of questions what god asks us is how are you going to get up and move on how are you going to become a better person and are you willing to let me in to help you through this process and are you willing to let our savior in to help you through this process and if we can just answer yes to that question yes i'll let you in yes i'll let my savior in we can be lifted to such unimaginable height oh there you go that wasn't jw broadcasting that was lds broadcasting or whatever they call their video first of all i was very confused when i went to their website because most of their videos aren't there they're on youtube what is going on with watch tech get on youtube like literally every other religion also it might help my numbers a little bit but yeah it's the same shit if you're a jehovah's witness watching that you don't believe that Mormons have the truth. You probably were a little depressed at watching this person who you believe to be a part of Satan's world, who is part of a false religion, going through an existential crisis about leaving his mission early and being so ashamed and, oh my God, the family's so sad and his brother doesn't have him to look up to. You're watching that as a witness thinking, this person is suffering for no reason. He's not even a part of the right religion. Now, if you left Jehovah's Witnesses, well, that'd be something to be sad about. See, I have a suspicion that if Jehovah's Witnesses saw more videos like this, they would realize how we see their videos. We, meaning ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, it's not that I have a malicious hatred of anybody or that I secretly want to come back. It's that I know it's not true and it's depressing to watch people suffering for something that's fake and so i hope that that was a useful visual example sorry it got a little sloppy at the end i intended only to cover half of the broadcast and i intended it to, to edit it in a week and it took a long long time because i just kept on adding more stuff and there's more stuff that i recorded that i'm not putting in the final version uh, maybe i'll put some deleted scenes on patreon but they aren't actually deleted it's just that i recorded the audio and didn't feel like editing any more of this fucking disastrous broadcast and whatever this multimedia response is i want to thank my patrons who allow me to take my time making stuff uh it's very satisfying to be able to make something that's comprehensive and cohesive uh but full disclosure i really hate it diving in deep to this broadcast so if i do a broadcast rebuttal in the future uh i'm not going to do it in this format jw broadcasting is the most disappointing thing since my son is that a good harry plinkett impression i don't know sorry i've been watching a lot of red letter media videos i think that the structure and formula of this particular rebuttal reflects the fact that i've been watching a lot of plinkett reviews you might not have noticed, but your brain did.